This episode is sponsored by JDAQA Software Testing, your scalable solution for manual, automated, security, and performance testing. Check us out at JDAQA.com. And with that, let's get on with the show. This is the first customer hosted by Jay Agnew. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the First Customer Podcast. My name is Jay Agner. Today, I am lucky enough to be joined by Scott Martinez. He is the CEO and founder of B2B Catalyst. I was just telling Scott, I saw him on some video and just walked away very impressed with his knowledge of outbound and, you know, it speaks to a lot of the problems I was having. And I think a lot of agency owners kind of go through some of the same stuff. So, Scott, uh, thank you so much for some of your time today, buddy. How are you? Good. I had a good weekend. How about you? A good weekend. Are you a father? Did you have a good Father's Day? I'm not. I actually flew to Michigan and I've been working a ton right now. So I flew to Michigan and I took most of Sunday off and I spent a lot of the day hanging out um, in Franklin with one of my newest employees who just started um, today. So it was, it was very fun. Beautiful. I love that. Yeah, it was a nice weekend. And uh, where are you based out of? I'm in Nashville. Nashville. That's right. The town that I... I'm dying to go to next. I have not been there yet, but I hear nothing but good things. Wait till the fall. Yeah, I was going to say, the summer, I have no interest in anywhere like above the Mason-Dixon line. I just want to keep going as north as possible for now. So where did you grow up, man? Did you grow up in Nashville? Where'd you grow up? And did that have any impact on you being uh, an entrepreneur? So I actually had no idea I was going to be an entrepreneur. I wanted, my dad was a physicist growing up. I grew up in Boulder, moved to Santa Barbara in 2004, high school, two years at the Naval Academy, went back six years doing part-time ministry, finished up college late, and I was kind of like, shit, I need a job. So I started working with this marketing agency, which it was interesting because I'd been in the agency space in some level for, for a while. And it was interesting because we started as an, and it was called this side up. We started as an implementation agency for Entreport, which was a marketing, sort of a marketing automation, overall business automation platform. And we started there. And what ended up happening is we grew to like 25K a month and we lost a couple of clients. But we, we grew up, blew up, and then I, I got let go. Um, and so that was kind of how I got my start into that. And that I, I saw a lot of what you were talking about the first customer, like, that was kind of something first customer company that was almost my first business customer. But I also got to see a lot of the challenges of nailing down the early product market fit and offer stuff, which is not easy to do for a lot of these companies. Like you, there are just so many moving parts to getting th that traction and delivery right, especially in the agency world. And what was that change for those guys? What was the kind of the golden ticket that made it all kind of come together? What well, didn't the business actually fold? Or oh, the business fold? I thought you meant it blew up as in like it got so big that you got like you know, it got bigger, it got to like twenty five k a month. with hired a few people, and then it like got then they had churn and it had okay. like the business you know it tanked, uh, and eventually they the founder joined one the joined another. The founder folded the business and worked as like a marketing ops person for someone else. So, so it did not work out. Okay, yeah. <laughs> fortunately, yeah. And what was next for you after that? I tried to start my own coaching business. Didn't work. Got a, got a little bit of client, but I just didn't have that much experience. I think that's something that is not messaged very well in the online marketing space. It's just like, okay, you just got to do a lot of work to get good at some point. And that's like, no one, that's not a popular message. I can see why people don't say it, but it's like, I think Alex Hermosi is a good, is doing a good job of bringing that out, but just like, Hey, you just have to get good at something. Like you have to get really, really good at something and then they'll pay you for it. And now I'm kind of finally at that point of mastery of like six, seven, eight years in and like, okay, I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot of things through the school of hard knocks. If I had intentionally practiced a lot sooner, I think I would have gotten to where I am a lot faster. So I tried to start my own business. I signed on as a business development rep for a vertical software as a service platform focused on auto repair companies. I went from the new speed ER to managing all the BDRs in that eight weeks, learned a ton, got fired 10 months later, 
worked with a construction company, helped them scale from 15K a month to 80K a month. They didn't want to pay me any more money. So I started working with marketing agencies at that point. And my first customer there was a company called Albatross Digital Golf. that was growing vertical focused marketing agencies, you can tell by the title. And they needed a way to get the founder out of the onboarding process because they were getting lead flow and help them do that. And they were able to double their MRR. Well, that was a quick turnaround from maybe not a quick turnaround, but I just want to talk you, you, you touched on something very key there. And I think the reason why people don't talk about it that much is because it's like the grind part. Right. It's like the shitty part of like having to get experience and work for a bunch of places. And like, there's, you know, everybody, everybody wants to hear that there's just like this thing you can do to go start a business or do whatever. But it, it really does seem like when all else fails, you can rely on that experience. And if you don't have that, like, and that's how I always understand, I don't understand with like super young business coaches. And I'm sure there's some that are great out there, but I'm always thinking in my head, like, how could a 20, you know, mid 20 something like really coach a CEO on anything uh, just because they haven't really been through it? So I, this is where I have a unique perspective on this because I've done a lot of my, through six years in ministry, I learned a lot about mentorship and emotional intelligence and psychology. And I also have an operation. You know, I also know a lot about a decent amount about the operation side of things from doing a lot of process mapping, software, marketing, positioning. And what happened, I think this is going to sound a little weird. I would bet you most of the time you have like a twenties business coach that's successful. It basically boils down to they're extremely emotionally intelligent. They're extremely smart, probably to 20, 10, 20, 30 bit and IQ points above their uh, target part of the market. And they probably have a lot of life experiences or family experiences in business. So my dad's a world-class physicist. So that means like. I behave very differently when it comes to learning math and science and breaking out new concepts because I grew up watching my dad like go through like, hey, what does a world leading physicist do? Like, don't like to, to boast about that, but I, I think that played a role in me being able to stop and learn. My dad, for instance, he had this behavior where he never, like a lot of parents kind of talk down to their kids if they could ask a question. If they ask a question, the parent doesn't know the parent get, might get frustrated or give a pat answer. Never got that from my dad. And so this created this embedded experience, this habit in me, like I am completely unafraid to say, I don't know what this means or how does this work? And so that like habit develops, de developed and it's kind of snowball over time. So mm. I think ISIS, a lot of those situations, they found a niche where there's like one thing this business coach is extremely, extremely good at. And there's one thing the market really, really sucks at. And then you're like, okay, I can go in and I can deliver a consistent result over consistent space. I find someone where the only sure. thing keeping them from their dream outcome is the one thing that I do really well. That's fair. Yeah. I guess it's not, I guess it's not business experience over decades that they're coaching them on. Like you said, it's, it's probably more emotional intelligence kind of stuff. That makes sense. Or, uh, in, or in analysis stuff. Like the, a lot of times something I'm seeing with a lot of sales and marketing teams right now, they're in the grind. And they do not have that. They, they do not have a good enough habit that of reflecting. So what happens is their nervous system is so heightened all the time. They are unable to be creative and think critically about their own process. They have no time and space to reflect. So they cannot see what is wrong with their system. Their nervous system is too wound up to get ever get to a place of insight. So. You can come in as an outsider and just like ask them questions and be like, what well, sounds like this? Right. Like, wow, that's amazing. It's like, well, all that really happened is someone who's someone with some knowledge and skills maybe that you didn't or of some frameworks and mental models that you didn't have, who's calmer than you came in and asked some questions. And suddenly this stuff pops out because you were too stressed and burned out to know what was really going on. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Uh, I have a friend who's a, public speaking coach, he's a younger guy. And I think he kind of hits that, just that niche of like, you know, giving you an outside perspective of like, well, yeah, public speaking is easy because a lot of us do it, but having somebody that's all they do come in and like kind of critique you on it is not something that you may even have the ability to process in the middle of doing all these, you know, 
public speaking events. And I think he's great at it. So that's a really fair point. So you brought me back around. Mid-20s coaches, I apologize. Uh, I think everybody should hire one. So tell me about B2B Catalyst, man. Like uh, I see all these cool posts. You know, I know you're like in the tools. And like I said, I saw you on a, a podcast. Like I think if I hadn't been like a student of learning outbound myself over the past few years, I probably a lot of that would have just like flown over my head, but it spoke to me directly because like I'm the sales guy for our organization and now I'm training our first salesperson. So like I, I know some of this stuff, but just first of all, what does B2B Catalyst do? And then we can kind of get into a little bit of the specifics. So let me answer that by telling the rest of my story up to today. The short answer is I have evolved through a lot of iterations by failing a lot. Is, is a, a, effectively what it boils down to. And one of the things that was, that's, so, so I'll go on. So I, I came up with this process of like, hey, I can process map out a, the business process of the company. And if I do that, then I can help them streamline and automate and revise and improve their process. So I started offering this methodology to agency owners and they, they all like the idea of having to do less work to get client results and make their business more scalable and stuff like that. But the problem was they would be like, well, this is cool, but I need to leave. And then I was like, well, I know more than these guys do about selling because I, I actually helped run an outbound sales team and I'm really good at the tech and tools. And I also need clients myself. So I started with like LinkedIn automation tools like you went way back in the day. And so then I was like, hey, I'll sell this thing called the automated sales assistant. We'll, we'll, we'll do LinkedIn and email outreach in parallel to reach out to people and it'll be great. And I did that and I, I did a couple different iterations of that. And I realized like, oh, like the target market I went after, I didn't really have language for target market. It was like, oh, first time I'm going to go for marketing agency. And then I have to go out for the founders of small B2B service companies. And what I realized is most of the companies that I worked with that crushed it, they had a decent online presence and they had a really good offer. Like probably the best offer that I, that the, the best overall client result I've gotten for someone was this company, Real Best Seller. And what Real Best Seller did, it was like, hey, would you like to write a book? Would you, what if you could publish a best-selling book on Amazon and get a course from that book and you don't have to write a word? You just show up to, if you, you have to show up to 10 interviews with a journalist and review some manuscripts and then you'll be a best-selling author. And so you put something like that in cold email, like, hey, do you want to become a best-selling author? And it doesn't have take any, any of your time or energy or muscle to write through. People are like, sure. We had incorrectly set up email domains that were booking a lot of meetings because of this, because it was just like, you know, the offer was so good. And we also had some copy from a previous agent. And then with other clients, they were like, I think I want maybe buy a 10 company in this company it's like well, what do you do it's like oh we're, we do this it and we do all these different things and what i realize now is like the problem is everyone ironically even marketing agencies they have the drill drill hole problem even marketing agents they know they're supposed to solve hole they know it. and they always sell the freaking drawer right and so that's kind of what i realized I'm like wait a minute all of these companies have positioning problems that's like most of the ones that are successful scale because of referrals. And then it creates this problem where they are confident in their selling abilities and they've never actually had to sell someone because they're just talking to her. Yep. And so then I was like, okay, I, I started going up market a little bit, started talking to actual sales team. And I landed a one-year contract with a company with like, as an ad tech company, they had four sales reps and we generated 399 interested leads over a one-year period with high volume. And we did a few other things too, but that was the core of it. The problem there was the lead, the follow-up on the leads was not good. So we helped them hire a BDR. And then the problem as well, looking back, was they missed a lot of their best practices on the sales calls. So it's a 45-minute pitch deck heavy call, no discovery questions. They didn't book a meeting, follow-up meeting from the meeting. And the, the reps did not consistently send follow-up anymore. So it's like, yeah, you're not going to book very many meetings for that. Sometimes I started to realize, wait, okay, automation is really powerful to generate leads, but you also need marketing positioning. And you also need good sales follow-up. And then I was like, well, this is pretty complicated. Like this is not as simple as just book more book meetings on your calendar and you're, you'll instantly close and get them. 
Right. And then I started expanding to other orgs and, and I kept, I started churning at the outbound engine or like, Hey, we'll build out the stuff. And gradually over time, the scope kept expanding now. And then what happened my epiphany a couple months ago was like, Oh, actually one, you need a sales process, but two, this actually becomes a culture problem. Okay. Hey, if you're telling sales reps how to follow up, but you're never actually inspecting their pipeline, seeing like, do they have actually qualified sales opportunities? Do they understand the value of what they're selling? Are they asking any discovery questions at all? Are their sales follow-up emails remotely useful? Then, you know, and the thing that, I, the, the issue I was having is like, I was always selling the medium versus right. selling the revenue. So now we're kind of switching into what I would call like a go-to-market operating partner. Basically that means like, we work with you to build out a go-to-market engine and sort of team management structure to help consistently scale and, and grow revenue. So I stepped in as fractional chief revenue officer for a $2 million fintech startup that's also a benefit and like an employee benefit. They've got three sales reps, a couple of people in partnerships, three marketers, that are, and a few account managers who are reporting to me and we're kind of trying to establish like, okay, we need, to, we have our board KPI forecast. We need to break that into specific activities. How much marketing content does marketing need to produce? How many contacts do we have to prospect? How many calls do we have to make? How many emails do we have to send? How many of the meetings we're booking? How many do we have to work into the next pipeline stage? What, what, what do we need to, as far as onboarding timeline, all those things. And we, and we also need to do things like we need to reposition the brand because a lot of the value props, we have a lot of values, a, a lot of features that other competitors in the space don't have, and we're not messaging efficiently on the phone. So mm -hmm. every, here's our market category and then, oh, you guys do like this. Well, yes, but this, well, we're actually here and not, so we have to reposition. Scope ends up, it's kind of the scope ends up getting broader and broader, but I think we've got a decent framework for this at this point. And that's kind of what I've realized is like, you can't really grow your sales without a culture change and real team alignment around, okay. And this really starts with internal alignment, like deciding, Hey, this is the kind of company I'm working with. This is the service I'm going to deliver. This is the value I'm going to create. This is my commitment to results. And like, you know, if you don't have all of those sort of people aspects in order in yourself first, mm -hmm. then the tools and techniques that doesn't really matter. Like I was having this conversation with this guy, this BDR reached out to me like, Hey, and I use your help building up a play table for my company. I was like, okay, what's your ICP? What's your target market? I was like, oh, we want to sell mobile apps. I was like, to who? And what's the business value? And he's like, are you kidding me? Mobile apps? Everyone's on their phone. I was like, no, that's not going to work. Like that, that's no, no C-suite person will ever respond to that. The C-suite people respond to, is this going to make me money, save me money or reduce risk? Tell me how mobile apps do one of those three things. And right. With whom you're going to do that for. If you don't have that, all the other tools are worthless. And most companies do not, have not seriously thought through. And it's not just enough to have like an airy, very high level thing. It's like, you need to back test this against your actual customer base. And then you need to be able to say, okay, this was our actual customer base. This is what we deliver, or th th this is our actual customer base. This is the part of our customer base that we want to deliver. This is how they show up in a data provider. This is what we're going to say to people who show up this way in a day for five. If you don't have that entire closed loop process, you can't really scale out and work a lot of marketing for that matter. I, I love what you said though, about, <laughs> you know, this, a lot of companies scale initially off referrals, which I have such a love hate relationship with referrals because they're not scalable and they're like such a beautiful thing. And they're so nice. And you know, they're just this hand, you know, hand packaged client for you but it's a really interesting point and we have a we had a similar issue with the our testing company because you know we did business through upwork forever and they're essentially very warm leads right i mean they have the social proof is there you know it's basically a referral essentially like they come to you they can see what you've done they know your pricing they know all these things and like it's basically very transactional like we need this thing you do this thing here take our money and go do that thing and like so to try to scale from that it was very much the same exercise you just described. And I think it's refreshing to hear that you yourself have gone through those iterations of like, what are we? Like, who are we going after? And like, you just kind of keep continuing to iterate and improve what it is you're offering these people and slimming it down. So it's, it's refreshing to hear that even a guy who does this all day, every day is still going through the same process that I think all agencies are going through, right? It's like kind of continually. And I actually love that feedback loop from like, 
sales back to the product, especially in services, because like you can totally hone what your product is right. to better fit your market and your messaging and then just go in this big loop. And if you do it right, you're kind of continually improving both, which is kind of a cool thing. I think that points back to the culture you're talking about because you get all that line together, yeah. then you can start to figure out, all right, what tools do we need for this stack? But I think tools are the ultimate, you know, shiny object syndrome, right? It's like, well, yeah. this one's really cool. Let's get spun up in this. And you spend a month doing that and you go, well, that's, now what do we, and you bang your head into the wall because you're messaging and all your other stuff sucks. So I think it's a really great set of yeah. points over those stories. Yeah. Um, and then the interesting thing is the further you dig into that, like the what it just gets so weird. Like I someone in my network reached out to me and is like, Hey, so I'm going after a restaurant and I use AI to scale. And I asked him a few questions. And I was like, So have you tried email? What's email like? He's like, I tried this guy and that guy and they didn't work. And it, and it was like, okay, are you getting any results from email right now? It's not really. It's almost all from the phone. And so I thought about it. I was like, emails, if you're not getting any replies, even opens or clicks from email, you, it's can't, probably not a good channel. It's not a market channel your market uses. I and mean, which makes sense for restaurant drivers. Right. Like I was like, I would do this one thing. I would do here are the two or three things I would consider. Get some mm -hmm. information for your calls with AI. So you have something you need to say. You, instead of having the SDRs manually call through all of their leads, look at something like connect and sell or virtual assistants to increase the, the conversations per day and a couple other things like that. But mm -hmm. then it's one of those things where you're like, you know, it's just not as simple as, yeah, we're going, you know, it's not like you, I think I, I would have made a lot more money right now if I had just picked the niche and picked the service, but I, I kind of feel happy with where I am now because like I had this weird whining. I kind of feel like God put me on this path because I'm now in this position where like I'm talking with companies like Zoom Info and Apollo, Common Room, Warmly, like, and I'm kind of like HubSpot. Like I'm kind of in this situation like, well, shit, like I know the mo I'm one of the most knowledgeable people about outbound fail tools or, or fail tools in general on the market right now. And like, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't be here with, without all of these weird winding paths, meandering through all these different things. And now I feel really happy about where I am. I think my comment on niche is like, discipline niche is good, but like, I am really glad. I think you need to fit, I think you need a niche that fits you. Like right. there's a lot of niches where like, you kind of have to dumb down what you're saying for them to want to buy it from you. B2B tech is not like that. And that's something I'm really thankful for. Like, I don't really want to sell. Like, I had one of my clients tell me, he's like, posts are too high level. Like, you need to dumb it down. Like, actually, I don't want to dumb it down. Because it's easier for me, like, very easy for me to market right now. I just post what I'm thinking. And then, like, leads show up in my calendar. And it's like, cool. I'm booked out two weeks at this point. Right? And I just post what I'm thinking about. It's so having something where that matches like, hey, here's actually your thought process and your values and unique life experiences. That's, I think, part of where you have a niche that actually fits you and doesn't feel like work. But you can scale in a niche that feels like work. Mm -hmm. but, but that is not a business I would want to be in for a long period of time. Like this is the kind of business where I'm like, okay, I can imagine myself staying in BB Tech for 20 years. Right. Because... All of the players here, I'm getting connected with these pretty crazy CEOs and marketers and sales reps. Like, I'm building all these relationships. And these relationships are going to stick around the longer I stay in this space. So the longer I stay in this space, the more value I'll have. Right. So that's no, I, I love it. really powerful. I, I agree. And I, I'm happy that you have kind of found this spot where you can... You know, it's the old, like, you know, you, you probably not feel like you're working as much because you're literally just doing what you enjoy doing right now. And you're being connected and talking to these. I mean, I'm not saying that you don't work, but it's much more fun to do work in the space that you feel like you can talk freely and kind of communicate effectively about. Two more questions real quick. This one just came up to me as I was going this. How much easier is it for a professional services or any sort of agency to sell a productized service 
versus kind of a customized service? How, how easy, is there any difference to you when, when you're marketing something like that or doing outbound? So I will actually go as far as to say you actually cannot sell a custom service outbound. And what I mean by that is it is actually no one buys a custom service off of outbound. So, so what, in, what in order for this to work, one of two things need to happen. Number one, you need to create indirect offer like a podcast to get that an initial conversation, really like Growth Partner on this, the FU Growth Partner with Hunter and Dost. Can't remember the name, but Growth Partner, guys. They, their, their playbook is basically, hey, do an interview method. Interview a bunch of different people in very specific job title, very specific industry about their challenges. Get a, put together a white table of all your learnings and share it with them. And in the process of doing those interviews, you essentially should be able to map out what your customer journey is. Joe Rojas does something very similar for MSPs. So that is, if you're not going to sell a productized service, you need to have an indirect con. This, by the way, I didn't know this, but this is actually the companies, a lot of consulting companies that are bigger, they engage firms like Frost and Sullivan to eventually, essentially sit, set up customer roundtable. Mm. And it's thought leadership. It's a lot of other things too, but it's also essentially a form of lead gen. You're getting right. this room in conversation with someone you can now follow up and book a sales call. So you need some form of offer like that. Or I just talked with a company that's the Amazon age. They had this great initial audit process where they give you this really complete audit and they, they just want to, they basically, as soon as they go through the audit, they have a very complete roadmap of, Hey, this is exactly what, this is exactly what you need in order to scale your Amazon. So I think like a process like that's or the, another example is like, hey, you do a productized service where we'll set up a, an outbound engine or look like your target account list or do a positioning workshop, whatever that is. You need some kind of put in your offer. Now you can go full productized and like just have one thing and you just sell that one thing over and over. And that's mm -hmm. a model that works. I don't like think that the LTV is very hard on those because what happens is if you sell to like 90% of the people in any given part of the market will not be a fit for that because your service will not be the only bottleneck. You're like, oh, I do Facebook ads for realtors. Well, guess what? A lot of realtors have more problems other than just not enough lead flow. They also suck at calling and follow-ups and closing and online branding. And like, if you will only get standout results if none of the other links in the chain are bottleneck. That's the yeah. hard. That's why I'm a fan of, more offers product, maybe not productized services, but more fleshed out solutions because it means you can solve more of the customer problems. No, well, I love the, uh, I mean, you know, we typically call it like some sort of wedge, right? Like just some way into these orgs if you have a custom, because we kind of have both. We have like a productized service for one of our offerings and then kind of this custom thing for the other side. And it's always been a bit of a mix for us on how we attack that. But I think that you're dead on like having, you've got to get the conversation started. Otherwise, like they're just, Nobody wants some custom thing you just email to them. They don't even want to, they don't want to, they don't want to understand. They don't have to figure out how to understand what it is that you do, right? They don't have the time to do that. So if you're not coming to them directly with something that gives them value, they're out the door. One final question, non-business related. I feel yeah. like I could talk to you all day. I need to have you back on. If you could do anything on earth and you knew you couldn't fail, what would it be? I, I mean, kind of what I'm doing right now, but. I, I kind of want to build BB Catalyst into like a hybrid of McKinsey and Accenture that kind of create, I want to, well, I'll, I'll, I want to, th there's not anything, but I think if I had to do just one thing, then I'd probably do which what I'm planning to do with BB Catalyst, which is I'm going to build in, into a consulting firm, kind of like a McKinsey Accenture hybrid that just essentially helps companies drive business growth. I want to create the strategy and help people execute it. And then I think I also want to create a methodology to make business growth inevitable as part of that. I think most people have too narrow of a view of business. And I think if you think about accounting, right? Like accounting is like, it's a very well-established framework right now. But people don't realize it's actually technology, right? Like there's a very defined way of like run your books this way. No one questions like, oh, you're in the red here. You have to fix this long item. We can do the same thing for business. Like, oh, you have brand debt. You have technical debt. You've got a sales process debt. Like that's what I want to do is I want to give 
will, and eventually potentially in other areas of life too, like, oh, your health is constrained because you're not sleeping and you're not sleeping every day. So it's kind of like help people do root cause analysis very quickly so they can figure out what is my bottleneck to growing my business in life. That's what I want to be for people. I want to start with, you know, two to $10 million B2B tech companies, but long-term, a lot of other people. I love that. Thank you. Mackenzie oh, and Accenture. True. Somewhere in between those two. Somewhere, I mean, anywhere between those is probably a good number. So <laughs> I think, and it feels like there's a book that will kind of come out at some point for this, you know, this journey of yours too. So, all right. Well, again, Scott, uh, I feel like I could talk to you forever. I feel like we didn't even talk about a bunch of things I wanted to talk about, but I'm going to have you back on eventually, maybe in between your 10 million sales calls that you queued up for yourself. If people want to reach out to you, Scott, LinkedIn, email, what's the best way to reach out to you directly? LinkedIn. Yeah. Got it. And yeah. uh, if you want B2B Catalyst, where do they find you? B2B Catalyst.com, but really LinkedIn is the best place to reach me. LinkedIn. Yeah. All right. It's the, it's the happening place. And all right, brother. The only Scott Martinez in the world, right? Are you? I'm pretty sure. I, I have not found another one. I've Googled many times. I mean, that's pretty. I, think, I need to get that domain. Do it right now. Yeah, I probably. If this, if, if this goes live, you may lose it to a squatter. So you better get that immediately. You could do that. I'm going to do, do it right. Do it right now. All right. Well, Scott, you're awesome, man. Thank you for your time today. We'll catch up again soon and, and be good. All right. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Appreciate it. Hey, Scott.